we had two things going on in China. Now, I gave you the little thing in here, and I'm not going to tell you the Bodhidharma story. Uh, yeah, I will. I'll tell it to you really fast, though. So Bodhidharma comes, and he he lands. He went by sea, and he landed. About half the people died going by sea. I think that's very telling that the boats sunk, you know, coming around from India to China. So it was pretty perilous. But they still did it because if they if the boat got there and got back, it's like when the Japanese sent the trade boats to China. They lost at least half of them, but the ones that got back, they made so much money that it was worth the, the, the gamble. And uh, so Bodhidharma goes to China. He arrives, and the emperor hears that this this personage has arrived, this this big shot monk. And so he uh, he calls him in to see him. And Bodhidharma he says, uh, "I'm I'm the emperor of China. I'm Emperor Wu." And uh, I'm a good guy. Now, remember that Buddhism had come in to China in the first century. And uh, this is like the sixth century. I, the reason I did a notepad is because uh, I don't do real good remembering dates anymore. Is the sixth century? No, it'd have to be seventh. So it was seventh century, 600 something. And he says, uh, he said, I, I build monasteries. At that time, they charged fees. Anybody that wanted to become a monk or a nun, they had to pay a licensing fee. He said, I would, I would, uh, uh, pay the cost of this, you know, for people to do it. I'd throw great vegetarian feasts. I've had sutra books printed and distributed free to the populace. And he says, so, uh, he says, how much merit have I accrued? Now, the Chinese had a notion of merit. And they, they already had it with their native religions, this idea of, of you did, if you did good stuff, you could accumulate this merit in heaven. And they had a notion of heaven, and it's got nothing to do with the Christian notion of heaven. Actually, their heaven sounds a lot more interesting to me. There's a bunch of guys up there, you know, sitting around and doing stuff. But, but it was not an ultimate. To them, heaven's not also not an ultimate place. So Bodhidharma looked him in the eyeball and said, no merit. You don't have any merit. So the emperor, the most powerful human being on the civilized world, and I'm always amazed that he just didn't have somebody lop his head off right there, you know, thunk. <laughs> yeah. He says, uh, well, okay, uh, but maybe you could answer this for me. What is the first principle of Buddhism? See, there was no Zen, so nobody was asking, what's the first principle of Zen? He said, what's the first principle of Buddhism? And that's the way the Chinese thought. You know, they they thought first and second and third and underlying principle and overarching stuff. Very practical, but still very philosophical. So he said, what's the first principle? And Bodhidharma replied, emptiness, no holiness. Well, that didn't make any more sense to the emperor than the first question he got. Okay. So, finally, he's getting a little ticked off, and he looks at Bodhidharma and he says, Okay, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm not real happy about this. Who is this monk that stands in front of me and says these things? And Bodhidharma said, I don't know. <laughs> and he left. Okay? This has a lot to do with what we're talking about. Emptiness is, is true self. Emptiness is nothing laid over. Emptiness is you don't have an opinion. It's not that you're not worthy to have an opinion or you're not small enough. Emptiness is you just taste the ice cream. You just smell the the flower. You just hear the music. You just do the work without a constant running dialogue in your head. When you're truly empty, you're truly full. There's no halfway measures in here. If you love somebody, you love them 100%. There, there really isn't 110%. You fill every little corner with love. That's Bodhidharma's emptiness. And no holiness. And what that holiness means is there's no distinctions. There is no emperor up here and, and foreign monk down here, barbarian monk down here. It's all level. And that's from the way we function. It isn't that somebody doesn't have to drive the train and somebody sit in it. Of course. 
But the train driver, who we really appreciate, and we hope he's a safe driver, we, we don't build shrines to him because he has that talent. We sit in the train waiting to go someplace to express ourself, our talent. And we all have this reserve of talent. We all have these abilities. And they do not do not in any way, shape, or form have to be the same. We've all got them. There's no such thing as an untalented person. There's no such thing as a person that is actually has value less than someone else. We get confused, though. We get confused because we do have presidents and governors and senators. And we have bosses. And we have CEOs that make more money. I mean, see, their CEOs make it now more than my dad made it his entire life. It's so phenomenal. <laughs> you know, I'm getting this magazine called Business Week for free. So I read it at lunchtime. And there's guys making, you know, $350 million a year. I don't even get it. I'd work one year and I'd be done. I'd say, okay, put my $350 million in the bank, take all my stock that you gave me and cash it out, and I'm gone. But that's me. Those people, because of what they do and how they do it, they get confused, and they think they're very, very important in the scheme of the world. They are important in their business. They are important, you know, Mr. Bush sends kids to the east and kids die. Yeah, he's really important because of what he's doing. But he's no more important than you are as a human being. And he doesn't need any more special treatment as a human being than you do. But we forget that. And sometimes we never knew that. And when Bodhidharma said, emptiness, no holiness, that's what he meant. When you can be your true self, you don't worry about it. And his disciples down through the ages, they expressed that because Master Lin Chi, you know, if it wouldn't be presumptuous, I would sign any official note, uh, man of no rank. But obviously I'd just be copying him and everybody would know it. But here was one of the greatest Zen masters that ever lived, and he always signed his papers, man of no rank. And he probably had to remind himself once in a while that he wasn't, that's special. Because you can get confused when you get into a high office or an important place or, or people treat you as special because they look at you as being holy. And he was holy. But that didn't make him any more valuable than his students. And that's a hard thing for people to get. You know? It's like, it's like the old story if we have ten people in a room and one of them has to die. How are we going to pick who dies? Or let's say you're in a room with ten people. How are you going to pick who dies? You ever heard that problem? They like to give it in philosophy classes. You know, one person is a doctor, another person's an engineer, and they give them, they give them all these occupations, and then you have to decide which, the, the idea behind it is that you pick out which people would you need the most. Well, you're going to have to save the doctor. Because everybody's going to get sick sometime. You know. So you're in a room, and you're going to take a vote. And you're going to vote on who dies. How do you pick it? What do you do? Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could ask for volunteers first. But what happens if you find out, much to your chagrin, you never expected this to happen? But the one person in there that you think should be, you should keep. Let's say the doctor. Let's say we got a lot of sick people in the room. The one person that you think that should be there above all other else is this doctor volunteers. Now, what happens if you all agreed, if we get a volunteer, we'll let the volunteer do it? you got a real problem. This is the kind of decision world leaders make. They decide one person's more important than another person. It's the argument, if you had to kill a musician, would you kill a rock musician or would you kill Beethoven? You know? <laughs> okay. Yeah, and it, it's it's a toughie. It's a toughie, and it's you know those kind of questions are to make you think. 
But I've got the solution to the problem of you're in a room with nine other people and you've got to pick someone to die. You do it. And then you solve the problem. 